people pay good money to see this movie. When they go out to a theater, they want cold sodas, hot popcorn, and no monsters in the projection booth. Everyone pretend podcasting isn't boring. Turn it off. Hey folks, welcome to Ego Fest 14. Yes, it is that time of year. Apparently I did this earlier this year, but this has been a weird year. And you're going to hear a lot about that as I talk through with Kyler Fay and also answer some listener questions. Even got a little section in here where I take questions from Dallas Norvell, who has sent in an audio recording of his questions. First up, we're going to hear from Kyler Fay asking what you wanted to know all about what's going on at the projection booth. Kyler Fay, thank you for joining me on Ego Fest 14. Thank you, Mike. I'm glad to be here. Feels like this it was a long time between Ego Fest, but I don't think it was that long. I think it's just been a long freaking year. I wanted to ask you, what kind of year has it been for you? The projection booth schedule has seemed kind of extra, really extra this year with and I was honestly getting a little like I was like, what month is it when I was listening to sci-fi July and I think it's check timber now. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what set me off so much. I think, I think it goes all the way back to February when I was doing some of those black action movies and the one with Philip Fenty was delayed forever because I was trying to get him as an interview. The one with Christopher St. John was delayed a little bit just because it was such a long interview to cut. And then, yeah, I think between that and then Super Mario Brothers being such a beast of an episode and all of the Indiana Jones stuff that it just put me completely off my game this year. Yeah, it was so many special reports, too. If I counted right, I think you had about 17 of them in June there because I remember there's one day I was getting I was hearing the the ding in my AirPods that that accompanies Patreon updates. And I, you know, after a while I looked at it and I'm like, Jesus Christ, there's like five new episodes <laughs> today. <laughs> it made me feel very, very unproductive and, uh, and, and unambitious, but yeah, good stuff though. Yeah. I just keep getting these interviews kind of landing in my lap and it's like, I don't want to turn them down. And so many of the people that I'm talking with are interesting. So sure. Actually, just this morning, I listened listen to your interview with the filmmakers of and i forgot the movie already the new horror movie oh, um, appendage appendage that's it yeah that was really interesting that's like really cool how they're able to throw that together like so quickly and have it be so good apparently yeah i had a lot of fun with that one yeah because i think they said they like kind of turned that around in about seven weeks or something which seemed just crazy but yeah that's that's really cool so, yeah i put that on the list anyway i'm looking forward to that one well, I hope you like it. Yeah, I'm sure it sounds just exactly like something I would. I was really glad, too, that they talked about their influences, because as I was watching it, I was like, oh, this is a little basket case. Oh, this is a little how to get ahead in advertising. Oh, oh, I see a little bit of Quattro here from uh, Total Recall. And so that they said, I think almost all of those plus some in the interview, I was like, OK, good. These folks are well aware of what they're doing. Yeah, they seemed they were really entertaining to listen to. Also, do you want to take a couple of questions from listeners? This is from Mladen Kulik. I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly. Mladen, sorry if that's not correct. A couple of questions here. I think kind of in a light, a little lighthearted vein. Specifically, are you pulling a George R. R. Martin with this 2001: A Space Odyssey episode that we've been uh, hearing about for years? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, because I think I recorded that with Keith and Jamie, not last year, but the year before. And yeah, I've the like I said, the Super Mario Brothers episode almost killed me with all of those interviews. And with this one, I, it's not even my interviews; it's stuff that Justin, my former podcast partner, Mondo Justin, recorded all these interviews, handed them all over, and then it's like, oh shit, now I got to make sense of this puzzle. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing too on something like that, you know, as I've listened to the show over the years, you know, hear an interview with 
you know, somebody who I know also, you know, did like visual effects or something on another film or whatever. Are you, when you get a hold of these people, are kind of capturing several subjects there and then la- and then later on kind of cutting that in when you get episode on 2001 or an episode on Brainstorm or something like that? It really depends, but I am trying. Like, I don't think when I spoke with um, Douglas Trumbull, I don't think I asked him any, well, not too much about 2001. Yeah. But usually if I am talking to somebody, I'll kind of bank a little bit for another episode. If I possibly can, I'm kind of doing the opposite right now with this Columbo podcast, because I'm going back through, you know, as I'm hitting these episodes, like the next one I'm recording is any old port in a storm. So I'm like, oh, well, I talked to Larry Cohen about that forever ago. So I'm like going back and dropping these things into these Columbo episodes now as I get to them and can have pertinent interviews. So sometimes it's like five seconds, 10 seconds, but you know, it's better than nothing. When you had that interview with Joel Schumacher, I was being me, I was really pleased that you did get a, a, a little question about Lost Boys there, even though that wasn't the topic of the episode. I, you were talking about uh, falling down, I think. Was yes, the, you're right. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I'm listening to that, and I'm like, oh, cool. He was a very, just a really cool guy, and that we lost kind of too soon, right? Well, yeah. After that interview, I was like, oh, man, I would love to talk with him more, not knowing that he was going to pass away so soon. Another question from Mladen, again, I think uh, in a little bit of a humorous vein, will your change in 2024 from a weekly film discussion podcast to a minute by minute examination of the classic film robo doc going to affect the podcast? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I made an offhanded remark on uh, my socials that I think it was around the time that I was talking about the other robo doc, the documentary about RoboCop. And I kept running across this incredibly just the look of this movie and it's out on YouTube in its entirety. This Alan thick film from 2009, where he is a robot doctor. It looks pretty amazing. In a world with heartless insurance companies, sleazy lawyers can't pay your electric bill. Sue your doctor. Overworked doctors. I'm finished. After the bye bye game over. Mm. In a world where the healthcare system is about to collapse. You, 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 you. Wait a second. That is our world. I don't think I'm going to be doing a full minute by minute podcast. Probably not a whole. Yeah. Yeah. I should leave that to the experts. Yeah. (laughs) I'm sure there's somebody who will do it. I haven't heard it, but somebody was telling me the other day that somebody's doing or has done a, a minute by minute on texas chainsaw massacre i guess uh uh, 60 seconds at a time for for a while i'm gonna try to find that that might be kind of kind of interesting to see i like i appreciate somebody gets real like obsessive about something like that can make a lot of content out of it yeah i think with something like that too if you could find interviews for most of those minutes you'd be all set yeah something like that could be like really cool yeah if you had some interviews some other content there Mladen has the third, qu- third and final question. Will you ever do an episode on the sci-fi thriller Frequency from 2000? I think, do you know that movie? I think I vaguely remember it. Yeah, that was uh, Jim Caviezel and Dennis Quaid. Yeah, okay, yeah. I, I saw that when it was new, I think, but not since. But that, yeah, one of these ones that, if you think about it too much, it gets into the, the time paradox, uh, time causality kind of thing that will drive you crazy if you uh (laughs) dwell on it too long yeah we would totally do an episode on frequency and you can guarantee that we would if you join our patreon and join at that level where you request movies i'll do whatever movie you request it's a good point i was just gonna say uh support the projection booth at patreon.com you need to open up a couple more regions in your cinema chain also let's get some more regional manager uh <laughs> level level patrons here <laughs> that's true that's true i mean it's weird as it is like right now i think i think it's like two or three months are being programmed by listeners for sure this year two solid months are being programmed by listeners which is wild 
I'm sure that I'll, I'm sure that everybody who does contribute to the Patreon and a lot of people who are I think are going to start now after hearing this just kind of appreciate what you have been doing all these years in terms of well a like you know good thoughtful intelligent discussion your show is never bombastic or crazy or you know or, or out of hand it's not like you know, somebody there, there's some shows around that sound like they're doing like am drive time radio or whatever and yeah this is not that you get really good guests really great interviews and i think what you're doing does a lot of work for toward preserving the history of these films the one i always like will point somebody to if i'm talking about your show is that amazing beyond the valley of the dolls episode which just kind of blew me away because there was like so many interviews and just so much stuff that i had never heard about before so I could see 50 years from now, like somebody's doing some academic research, whatever related to that. And they'll, they'll, they'll find your show and have some kind of, you know, some primary source material. I think that's pretty cool. That's what I'm really open for. Yeah. I know some people have said, oh, this should be taught in school or there, this needs to be preserved in libraries. And like, yeah, sounds great. Former co-host Rob St. Mary, he actually has a degree now, I think, in library science or archive archiving, I think it is. I'm like, hook me up with your person because I would love to get this stuff archived because he's archived a lot of the punk rock material that he's done research on. I'm like, I'd love to take some of these drives and books and all this stuff and donate it to the library. That belongs in a museum. That'd be great. I'm sure yeah, some future scholars will appreciate it for sure. I got another good question for you, Mike. This is from Jason Jeffers. If you could go back in time and do a Hearts of Darkness style documentary on any movie, what would it be? Ironically, I would like to do one if I could, if I had a magic wand or that time machine. I would love to do another Francis Ford Coppola movie, and that is Supernova. Because oh, right. Yeah, you know that that is a crazy history going on there, and I'd love to get all the details. Yeah, that would yeah that would be interesting. Yeah, that's a yeah, it's definitely an interesting one to think about. There's 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 so many. It's like that's what's kind of fun about learning about this history is some of this this background. I mean, somebody who was really gutsy to do one on the Twilight Zone movie that'd be pretty interesting. That's a tough one to approach. I think, but yeah, that would be very interesting. That which you mentioned Twilight Zone that made me remember some, a lot of these other side projects you have, like the Twilight Zone 85 series and, you know, the Columbo series. I only just a couple of weeks ago realized that you guys were doing a night calorie. Oh, yeah. uh, Yeah. And I started, uh, is that, are you all the way through that or is that still ongoing? I only, I'm only like four episodes in, I think. We record that one and have been recording that one often enough that Father Malone, I think he's doing two episodes a month. It was supposed to originally be monthly. So I think we're, I think he and I and Chris are ahead, obviously, when it comes to recording, but we're about to record our final episode of that. And then we're talking about, maybe keeping the same name and then moving on to other anthology horrors, maybe like tales from the dark side or some other stuff. And rather than rebranding each time, we might just take uh, midnight viewing as the title and uh, just say midnight viewing colon, whatever, you know, anthology um, appreciation or something. Oh yeah. That would be super cool. I would push for tales from the dark side. I love that when I, when, when I was a kid, that was, it was, it was kind of a fun thing to get creeped out by. It was like the, just that opening theme and that na- opening narration was just terrifying, but then yes. I was, <laughs> but also like a lot, a lot of fun. Yeah. I love that show. We did have a question. I, I wanted to ask you, Mike, this, you got this via audio from Dallas Norville. Are you going to put his audio into the show? Yeah. Or, yeah. okay. Okay. So I won't go through the whole thing however just a couple of a couple of bullet points which i kind of related to something i just said about how do you have time to do all these shows you know you know it's like all the interviews the editing the what's the day in the life of mike white look like i mean maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that and he asks at the end is it just a hundred percent emails it baffles my mind <laughs> like next week is freaking crazy this week's pretty crazy too so i've got 
every single night I've got two or three different things going on. Plus I also need to watch all the movies and TV shows that I have to watch. So Saturday I'm recording a a new series that will be announced pretty soon. That's going to be a Patreon only thing. Uh, No, I announced it in the friends of the projection booth group on Facebook. So it's kind of out there, but I'll make it more public soon. Yeah. Tuesday I'm recording an interview and then two episodes Tuesday night. I go to trivia Wednesday night. I'm recording two episodes Thursday night. I'm hopefully watching some movies for Saturday because Sunday or Saturday, I've got three recordings, which is pretty unusual for me. I try to keep the weekends free to edit if I can, but yeah, I'm recording an interview with AJ Black about his new book, Lost Federations. I'm guesting on Mark Begley's podcast, an episode about foul play, and I'm guesting on another one, and we're going to be talking about Joe versus the Volcano. And then Friday night, I'm going to see The Seven Samurai. There's new restoration of that at the Detroit Film Theater, and I haven't seen that one in about 30 years. Yeah, that'd be fantastic uh, seeing it projected. I don't remember if I saw it projected on the big screen or if I just saw it on a little TV. I think I, I watched both. Yeah, that's like super cool. And a really, really packed schedule. And aside from all that, you got like a regular day job. Yes. Don't you do? yes. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and you're married, right? Also. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, you got to two. So a lot of people, it sounds like there's might be like two of you or three of you, like uh, uh, taking care of all this. But no, that's that's amazing, and uh, everybody loves all that, just all, all that content. I know, I guess with the, the Twilight Zone show and the Night Gallery show, I assume those would be as like time demanding. You're not always like you're not always pulling in interviews for those, or, or the episodes aren't as long. And right of all the stuff that I'm recording next week, I only am editing two things so that's pretty good not not too bad then no no but that i'm a month behind on editing doesn't help it sounds like after yes after so many years of doing this uh, it seems pretty clear you, you really like this you don't get tired of it do you or, or are there days where you're like ah oh, this is just a job there are sometimes especially when you put all this work behind it and it feels like nobody's even listening and it's just like oh Okay. You know, you just put all this stuff out and you're like, well, hopefully somebody enjoyed this. So it's always nice when I get feedback. So things like this, where it's like actually taking listener questions and stuff, it's like, oh, okay. People are paying attention, even paying attention to my bad jokes on social media. So I appreciate that. My sort of side hobby is um, I write fiction and most of it's pretty, pretty niche and pretty limited. And it's, appeal i would think and so all the time i'm like i'm kind of amazed when somebody gives me some feedback it's like oh wow somebody actually read it i didn't think anybody read this book and then but at the same time i'm like i'm like oh my god people are reading this i'm terrified to hear what they have to say but it's uh, <laughs> it's you know it's a, a life of uh i guess creating something and putting it out in the public you know daniel davis is wondering this is an interesting question what was the hardest movie for you to do research for as in the information was surprisingly limited on it? Something come to mind. Yeah. um, It feels like when it comes to difficult episodes to put together, there's a couple categories. One is check timber because whenever I'm doing that, there's usually very little written about the films or if it is, I can't find it and it might not be in English. So that makes it tough. Luckily, after doing this for so many years and having so many good co-hosts on there, it's like, I feel like I'm starting to be able to navigate some of the waters on my own, which is nice. There's a couple books that I rely on for all those episodes, but they don't cover everything. Like, especially this month, Murder Check Style and um, Murder of Mr. Mr. Devil, they're very scant as far as information. Uh, The other category I would say is probably adult films. Not a lot of scholarly stuff written about those, unfortunately. And then some of the black exploitation films, some of the black action films are really tough to find actual articles written about them other than like, oh, this is awesome. This is so cool. And when this guy shoots this other guy, it's awesome. And it's like, yeah, maybe we want to look at this a little, a little bit more in depth. 
And then I think the other thing was, uh, if ever a movie is a huge failure, nobody wants to talk about it. I mean, I suppose you probably run into that trying to find interview subjects where you'll somebody will be like, I, I there's no way I'm talking to you about that. That was I put that in the past yeah <laughs> in those cases there might be people who you know they they might they might assume that the motive is to you know you may be doing some hit piece on the movie or making fun of it or something rather than appreciating it which uh makes it harder yeah and i think one of dallas's questions kind of gets into that as far as bad reactions to stuff and i've definitely had some bad reactions to some of the things that i've done the um uh, especially the die laughing episode is the most infamous for myself when it comes to that. The hardest interview I heard you do was some years back that uh, was uh, the blast of silence oh, God. episode with Alan Barron. Oh my God. The, yeah. <laughs> I was, I was listening to that. I was, I was almost like, I have nothing to do with this. And I'm feeling like really tense and kind of embarrassed because <laughs> he was, so, he was so, he was so brutal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was tough. And then I so wanted to actually try with him again because he had directed a bunch of Kolchak episodes and I was like, Oh, maybe he's in a better mood this time. But, um, I can't remember who it was responded to a recent posting. I, I, I made about blast of silence. Oh, cause it's coming out on criterion is what it is. And he was like, Oh yeah, I was, talking with him years ago and he was kind of lo- losing his mind and started calling me by his son's name and all this. I was like, Oh, that's really bad. So yeah, I don't know how far along he was when I talked with him, but it's like, okay, I won't make fun of Alan Barron anymore. Yeah. That can be a, uh, yeah, that can be tough when it gets to that point. <laughs> Your Colchak show is how I discovered the projection booth. Actually. Oh, nice. Funnily enough, I was, kind of right at the start of covid i was never like completely out of work the whole time i was kind of but i was i didn't have as much to do it was almost like this vacation and i took up walking in the park for miles every day and i realized the sound of my own thoughts were not going to work for that so i i needed podcasts to listen to and yeah, I was, for some reason, I was thinking about Kolchak, and I was like, "There's got to be some other nerd around that likes Kolchak and did a podcast about it." That's that's how that's how I found that. So I listened to a few of those, and at the end of the show, when you and Chris talk about about other shows, I'm like, "Oh, I got to check that out too." And then I was like, "Oh, cool!" And there's already hundreds of episodes <laughs> in the can <laughs> that, I, that I can go through because I like. A, I appreciate quantity almost as much as quality sometimes when, <laughs> when, I'm, when I'm trying to find something to fill the time. So briefly a moment ago, yeah, you brought up difficulty in finding a lot of you know, scholarly work on adult films. Jim Stevens asked if you are planning to do another adult movie month anytime soon. Um, like you did, maybe it was that last year, year before you had the, and he mentions that uh, the vinegar syndrome offshoot Melusine. I'm not sure if that's the right pronunciation. Anyway, it's, I guess, an imprint or a partner label of a Vinegar Syndrome that is uh, apparently putting out some of these films on oh, okay. uh, on Blue now. Yeah. I looked at their site briefly because I hadn't heard of it. They got, they got a lot of stuff. A vinegar Syndrome in general is kind of kind of amazing, all the stuff they've put on, on Blu-ray over the years. You know, things I never would have thought that anybody would really put up the money to even, even make that available. So are there any other adult films you want to get on the docket or thinking about doing some coverage of? Oh yeah, definitely. I've got, I've got a, well, I've got a few running lists, but I've got a big list of whenever I hear something or think of something, I'll just kind of throw it on there and then I'll try to organize those towards the end of the year. So next year I can safely say there's, there's no adult fare. There might be one risque movie, this Japanese movie that I'm covering, but that's about it. But as far as like pure adult titles, I mean, there's a ton I want to do, just not 2024. Hopefully I can have uh, the Rialto Report folks back in 2025 and we could do another month of stuff. Cause that would be super cool. Um, I really enjoyed the episode of, well, actually, each time you had Ashley on talking about films is so great because Rialto Report is amazing with what they're doing uh, again it's like preservation activity like an archiving 
kind of thing that I think is like super important. And, and it's going to be, people are going to appreciate that years and years from now that this, this history has been captured and that they've been able to talk to so many of these people who are, you know, fortunately still alive, you know, who have their, their stories to tell from back, you know, back in the seventies. So yeah, it's a really good show. Yeah. I really like what they're doing. And yeah, I would love to looking at this, uh, Melusine or Melusine, however you pronounce it site. Uh, I mean, Marilyn and the Senator is one I would love to cover just because there's an actress in there who's also in black shampoo. So if I, and I think she's still around, so I would love to talk with her and yeah, like there's a whole bunch of stuff like the, what's it called? Like ultra flesh or Cabaret. Yeah. That, I've got them all written down and yeah, there's a bunch of stuff I'd love to talk about. Yeah. I'm sure everybody, uh, everybody's looking forward to some more of that. What I just thought of, I don't feel like I have over the course of time heard you brag enough about Dune and your commentary on the uh, <laughs> <laughs> David Lynch's Dune on that amazing Blu-ray. It's so good. How did you? How did you luck? That must have been almost like a dream. I mean, because oh, you, you were yeah. like a a fan from the start. I would assume with with that movie. Yeah. No, it didn't really come into my life until. Well, I did watch it in the late eighties when it was on TV and just, I was like, my God, this movie's so long because with commercials and the extra scenes and stuff, it felt like it took all afternoon to play, but it was really after second watch of Twin Peaks with a friend of mine and his nephew and his nephew recognized so many of the actors from Dune. So he would see, you know, he would see Big Ed, he'd be like, you know, oh, I'm Stilgar or whatever. And I'm like, oh, okay. This is, I'm like, what is this you're talking about? And he's like, oh, Dune, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. So went back and reevaluated. And I was like, oh, yeah, this is terrific. Yeah. I want to say Bill Ackerman, because Bill's always looking out for me. There's a lot of people that look out for me, which I really appreciate. And I want to say that Bill somehow found out that they were doing this and then, basically pitched me to do the commentary and i was like holy cow this is fantastic and yeah i loved putting that together bill ackerman i've it's been a while but i listened to at least most of his series supporting characters which you were featured in one of those interviews that was all really interesting too like uh some of these uh uh some of the guests he found but yeah that's that's so cool dune anyway because i love that i I think it was one of the first VHS tapes that I got. Nice. <laughs> and, then, and then when I got a DVD player, it was like, it was about the first thing that I bought. I hated that TV cut though, when that it just too long and not, it was not right. But yeah. I know a lot of people like to have those extra scenes though. I prefer the fan edits that people have done, especially when they've gone back in and corrected the eyes and cleaned up some of the imagery yeah. and stuff. But yeah. And then depending on what they add, like, I don't really care for that animated. Well, it's basically like storyboards plus the narration, especially because that takes away a lot of, uh, Irulan's dialogue at the beginning and makes her even more superfluous. No, I agree with that. I was like, yeah, what did, what is this? Yeah. It was basically storyboards. And then this, you know, kind of strange narrator voice trying to give you like this whole back history of, you know, of the Dune universe in a, in a few minutes. And it was just kind of weird, but anyway, congratulations getting to do that commentary though. It's a really good commentary. The disc is beautiful. I was just loved every, every minute of it. So. Yeah. I was very happy. And especially finding out about Ross Pallenberg and really Rudy Wurlitzer working on that and then being able to reach out to those guys and be like, okay, tell me more stuff. And unfortunately I didn't have that much time to put that together once I found they were involved. So I got a little bit of feedback from Rudy, a little bit more from Rospo. So at least I got them on the record saying what they would had been working on. And, you know, I think, I think it was Rudy was working with Ridley Scott a little bit, which is interesting. And to hear, Cause that's the whole like infamous, you know, Oh, there was, they were adding an insistuous relationship between Paul and his mother, lady Jessica. And he's like, yeah, no, not really. And I was like, well, I can see where you can add that in though, because once the father's out of the picture. Yeah. I remember hearing, I guess, Frank Herbert talk about 
that script or that or that concept on an interview. There's a there's an interview with him and Lynch together that was on a like a cassette tape. Yeah, when I was a kid, when I found out about that, I was sort of looking for you know kind of any bit of ephemera related to that. I was like, oh, cool, I'm going to buy this tape, and then got the the Dune Encyclopedia, which doesn't doesn't really match up with a lot of you know what you see in in the in frank herbert's books but still pretty cool yeah just just a lot of a lot of neat stuff but it wasn't like a it wasn't one of those sci-fi things where well i know they tried but it wasn't one that was natural for like action figures and toys and but they they did roll out some of that and i have a um i have a board game (laughs) actually based on the Based on, based on the Lynch, uh, David Lynch Dune, yeah, which is kind of kind of cool. There's company trying to read the label here, Reflection or something, where they put out Dune figures recently and made them look exactly like the old ones, but they have new boards to them and stuff. They look gorgeous. Mark Begley sent me one of the Pauls because I think there's two Pauls, and then um, Baron Harkonnen, and it's just love that he did that. And then I guess we're delayed a little bit again on the release of the part two of the new Dune. I think I recall you're, you're not a big fan of that though. Are you the, the first one? Not overly. I mean, I just love that Lynch one so much. It's so tough to let that other one into my heart. And plus it just feels more sterile in some ways. It's, it's like, I don't know. It's kind of amazing to look at sometimes, but then at the same time, yeah, I don't feel the, like the heart there. That's, seems to come through in the previous one but yeah dude dune yeah dune is a weird uh it's a weird concept so it's interesting to see somebody try to do something with it that that sci-fi channel tv version was not good uh, i kind i kind of liked better that children of dune one not still not great but it was better than the it was better than that first one and really the only thing when i think back on it what did i like about it so much it was really just the one sequence where the, as the the children of Dune themselves are being born, and then all of Paul Atreides' enemies are getting whacked, you know, as that's happening, <laughs> it's it's sort of reminded me of that, you know, like like the Godfather where yeah, the going say, yeah. on, and, they, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then in the back in the background, everybody's getting like gunned down. That was pretty cool. But there is a question from oh i'm sorry where did i lose it we're gonna need a little context on this or me at least because i have no idea what he's asking but james brummel asks do you still serve those little pizza i have been racking my brain for the longest time like when the early question about robodoc came in i was just like what and then so I don't know if I made some sort of joke or something that James is picking up on here, but I don't know what he means. So clearly you were never in the business of selling. You didn't have a pizzeria or something at any I point. I where- <laughs> did not. No, no. And I'm trying to think of like, was there like a Mike White's pizza thing or is there, is it a reference to like White Lotus or something? I, I don't know. So, so my answer is yes, I'm still selling those little pizzas. There you go, James. Mike is still serving those little pizzas. Yes. So, um, come and get them. We're, we're, we're in good shape with that. <laughs> of the interviews you have done, what are, what's the one or there may be the couple few very, like, so the top, top gets as far as somebody who's really a big deal, like, you know, really well known. Well, it's funny because I used to have a coworker who would ask me, So, who have you talked to lately? And I would tell him, and then he would say, Who have you talked to lately that I would know? So like saying like Peter Bogdanovich or William Friedkin, he'd be like, no, I have no idea who that is. It was a big deal for me. So when I finally landed like Willem Dafoe or Jeff Goldblum, then it's like, oh, I know who those guys are. Like, all right, great. Those are probably two of my biggest getting those guys. I guess that makes sense. Like an actor like that is going to be more recognizable to somebody who's not deep into being a cinephile. I don't know if I heard that interview. You said mentioned Friedkin. When did you when did you talk to him? What movie were you? Uh Sorcerer. Sorcerer. Seems like I would have listened to that. I might have missed that one. I'll I'll look that up though, because I, I would love to hear that. I like uh I like any interview with Friedkin. <laughs> um it's always uh it's always kind of entertaining. And I watched his 
And a documentary that was basically kind of a long interview with him about The Exorcist. And that was really interesting. It always takes me a second to anymore to not hear kind of Donald Trump's voice because he has almost that same that same accent and, and inflection. So you could almost ima- you could almost imagine like when he's like tearing into somebody that it's like like a like a Trumpy sounding attack. But yeah, um yeah he's a yeah it was very, very that was a very interesting film. And yeah, again, somebody we lost recently, which is a shame. I it's kind of funny because I left the end of our interview in that because it goes uh it was like something something you're like okay mark call me whenever and we'll talk (laughs) 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 so i did try to get a hold of him for cruising and to live and die in la never got a response at all so that was kind of a bummer and especially because it made sense well with Sorcerer, it was coming back out, I believe, on Blu-ray. And then it was kind of the same thing for Cruising, not to live and die in L.A., but at least with Cruising, it was right around the time that it was being remastered for Arrow, I think. So, yeah, no ch- no response from that. But that episode, I love that episode. Yeah, I need to make a note of that right now because it seems like I would have. So... When I did first start listening to the projection booth, there are already so many episodes already done. And I kind of just went through the list and kind of cherry picked like, uh, you know, stuff. It's like, oh, oh like, oh, my God, there's an episode on the brood. And, and, uh, and you know, here's something about Deep End. And here's if so I would kind of go through a bunch of those. And Sorcerer seems like something I would have picked out. I may just not remember it, but I'll uh, double check it. I bet that was I bet that's interesting. It has been a while. So, I mean, we've been doing this for over 12 years, so there's, you know, stuff gets lost for sure. That's why I try to keep the Wikipedia and the, um, there's an archive page on projectionboothpodcast.com that I try to keep both of those updated if I can. A few weeks back, I went way back into the archive and listened to episode number one. Wow. About the stunt man projection booth number one in march 9 of 2011 i think was uh was that date when there's been a show that's on for a long time that i haven't followed from the beginning i always wonder if like like it's a bad idea to go back to the very start of it you know because <laughs> it's like it's like it couldn't possibly have been that great in the first episode but uh act- Actually, it kind of was. You guys are totally great in that first episode. It was like the show just kind of emerged in its in its form, you know. Immediately, you and Justin both sound you sound a little more like a little more tentative, maybe a little more scripted. Not quite as not quite as natural as things were later, but you had the good discussion of the film. There's a couple of interviews, and I'm like, yeah, this is just this is basically the same show that i've been listening to this whole time i don't know if that's something to even consciously think about kind of just the style and format and the structure of the show but it seems to really work and it doesn't seem like you've had to mess with it too much over the years yeah he really helped raise the bar in that first episode by having the interviews and stuff so kind of threw down the gauntlet so when it came to even episode two it's like well Now we got to find an interview. How are we going to do this? And the second episode, I think, was Abar, the first black Superman. So tracking down uh, Tobar Mayo, and I can't remember if that was Justin or me. I think it was Justin found him. That was amazing. And I don't know how many people, hopefully he's still alive, but I don't know how many people have interviewed Tobar Mayo over the years. And he was terrific to talk with. Well, I have a lot of social anxiety and nervousness about talking to anybody so so i imagine like okay i'm gonna start my new podcast and i I need to contact somebody i want to interview you for my new show that hasn't even started yet how about it i would be like (laughs) i'd be worried and it'd be like it'd be like who the hell are you why why are you why are you emailing me but yeah well luckily both justin and i had track records so we could say like you know, Justin's interviewed all these people. He's written this and that and the other thing. You know, I had the zine for all those years. I've interviewed a bunch of people or did interview a bun- bunch of people for that. So at least we had a little little bit of cred. So it wasn't like, hey, we're two yahoos starting this thing that you don't even know what it is because podcasts were 
they were around, but they weren't nearly as popular as they are today. It's not like every comedian in the world didn't have a podcast back then. Yeah, it's just a. I just think it's just kind of amazing that you've kept it up at this quality and this level of productivity for so many years. And hopefully, our listeners will help out by going to patreon.com and uh, supporting the projection booth. I'm looking to see if we had any other. Did I, I'm just going to make sure I didn't miss any of the listener questions in all of did. my in all of my uh, babbling here. <laughs> no, I think I think I caught them all. I think the uh, I think the little pizzas was less. I think I was, I was saving that for the end there. So I think yeah. we're <laughs> I think we're good. <laughs> Kyler, before we wrap up, you said you're working on your fiction. Is there a good place for people to keep up with you and your work? You can just search me as Kyler Fay on Amazon. A lot of my publications will kind of turn up there. On social media, I'm still hanging in there on Twitter. And I'm not calling it X. They need to stop trying to make X be a thing. Yeah, Twitter, it's really bad now. But yeah, still still there. I did get on Blue Sky. I can be found there. I'm trying to I'm kind of trying to rebuild my my Twitter base there because I think Twitter is about to completely die. Yeah, I'm on a couple other socials that like I technically have accounts, but I don't really know how to use them. Like Instagram. I barely interacted with a uh, mastodon. I don't really understand, but yeah, I think blue sky and Twitter are, are ways to reach me on social. And I do have, I got a, I got a new publication coming pretty soon. I was trying to, I, I started promising everybody Halloween. That's this month. I might make it. I was hoping by tonight while we're talking to be able to say that I have a pre-order up. Um, but I don't, <laughs> but that, that makes, that makes, that may still happen yet in October, but I'm still shooting for, uh, October 31 for my weird horror story, the vampire circus, which is kind of an homage to the f- hammer film of that title, um, which I had intended to have out months ago. Like that should have been in the past already. Uh, what's holding me up now is I really want to do a, a paperback double with another story. I've done I've done that a couple other times before, and I formatting on that takes like a little while. And I haven't started, but I have another. I got a like sort of a B side that I want to kind of put back to back like that with Vampire Circus. But there'll be there will be the ebooks if if the paper if the paper isn't ready by deadline. You know, the other ebook will be there, and I'll uh, I'll I'll get on the get on the socials and and brag about it. I got kind of obsessed with that movie like a few years ago for some reason. And my story is like a lot different, but I kept the structure a little bit in the sense that my book has a really long prologue. The film does too. There's like a pre-credit sequence that it's like 11 or 12 minutes of like an 87 minute movie. And, and it's like, uh, and it's basically a little mini hammer vampire film like from from start to finish from you know vampire depredations happening the village rising up the you know destroying the vampire burning down the castle the end that all half kind of happens there and it kind of occurred to me that almost any of those films could probably be cut to that you know with the big fire always always at the end so so i did did a little bit of that with having a um kind of a full, uh, full on, maybe too much of a story kind of as the prologue. And then it gets into the, into the main business. So I, I kept the, it's a little bit, uh, a little bit erotic. A lot of my, uh, a lot of my previously published stuff, some, well, some of it is like just out and out, like gay pornography, but uh, vampire circus is not going to be quite so much. There's a little, there's a little bit of that content. Again, the movie was, was a little bit like that too, though. So I think once this is done, I'll kind of have that worked through my mind and can move on to a different obsession. Well, I look forward to talking to you in a couple of weeks about Arcana. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I am very much looking forward to that. That's going to be... Actually, that that's one. Back to one of the listeners' questions about uh, movies hard to research. It is... Nobody, nobody has talked about that hardly. It's... um. Yeah, we'll uh, I'm sure we'll cover all that when we get into that one. Well, thank you so much for helping me with this Eco Fest. I appreciate this. That was a lot of fun. Thank you for inviting me.
Mike. Guess we made it to another Ego Fest. Have a few questions. Uh, I've been loving all the special episodes with uh, interviews with uh, behind the scene personnel on the RuPaul show. Any chance we're going to get an interview with RuPaul himself? I'm so glad that you've been enjoying the RuPaul stuff. Uh, I've been very fortunate to be able to speak with some of the folks behind the scenes. I was offered an interview with Sasha Colby, and I was really hoping that that would come through, but unfortunately that didn't occur. But yeah, with RuPaul herself, I would love to have an interview with Ru. That would be fantastic. I actually did try to talk with Ru back when we were covering, but I'm a cheerleader. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. Um, neither did speaking with Natasha Leon. Um, that is another dream interview. I would love to have Rue on the show. I don't know if it's going to be ever offered to me, but if it is, I would definitely take that chance. I thought the bullet episode was quite thoughtful, given that everyone seemed to agree it's not the best film in the world. Um, but it made me wonder. How often do you have guests that want to retract their their participation in a episode? Um, can you talk about any bad feedback you've had from interview subjects or filmmakers or anyone participating in an episode before? So as for guests that would want to retract their participation, I think the biggest controversy I ever had with a participant in an episode. Well, actually I can think of two instances. One was, one was Garrett Brown, the inventor of the study cam. I spoke with him for the shining episode because the study cam plays such a huge part in that movie. Mr. Brown was not happy with the way that I edited him. Uh, he was taking a long time to answer things. So I, did what we call on audacity truncate silence. So I took out a lot of the silence between the words or the phrases that he was using. Maybe I was a little too aggressive and sped him up a little bit too much, but he was not happy with what we ended up with. He listened to that episode and he actually was like, put back the original blah, blah, blah. But I was like, yeah, I've already edited this and I don't think I'm going to cut it again. So probably won't be having Garrett Brown back on the show. Unfortunately, the other person who wasn't very happy with the way that uh, the episode itself turned out. So he was fine with the way that I cut him was not fine with the discussion of the film. That was Jeff Werner, who was the director of the film die laughing if you don't remember, Die Laughing was the episode uh, about a Robbie Benson film where actually Carl Striken was on that episode. That was really fantastic talking with him. That's Robbie Benson as a uh, wannabe rock star who ends up with a monkey that knows these Russian nuclear secrets. And he's being pursued by Bud Court, Larry Hankin, and a whole bunch of other character actors. And I like the movie. Uh, it, it's stupid as shit, but I like the movie. And I guess that whole, but it's stupid as shit thing really rubbed Mr. Warner the wrong way. And so he was not happy with how we, uh, ended up talking about that episode. So, uh, yeah, we definitely have had feedback like that. When Netflix canceled their DVD subscriptions, uh, I noticed that they gave us a link to download all our uh, rental history. And the first question that came to mind was, I wonder what the fuck Mike White's rental history looks like. Any chance you want to share that with us, post a link, or even do an episode talking about the history of films? That It might be more than one episode, but uh, I'd be curious to know what your rental history looked like. So if I were to share my Netflix history, you're probably going to get, well, you're definitely going to get all of the movies that my wife has watched as well. I went back and I did download my Netflix history after you sent in this question. And it, yeah, it's pretty boring. I can share that with you maybe as a PDF or a downloadable um, Excel file, but it's going to be pretty darn boring. You're going to see things like, oh, Mike was on a Veronica Mars kick, or 
watched all of the uh, Blown Away episodes on Netflix, uh, because it actually includes all the streaming stuff as well. Uh, Yeah, I can definitely share that. Uh, If people are curious about what I'm watching, I have been trying to be very vigilant about keeping track of things over on Letterboxd. I, I can't remember. Somebody was making a comment about, oh, you must watch so many movies a year. And I was like, I don't think that I do. I don't think that I watch a ton of stuff. Um, probably more than a normal person would, but not as much as even some of my friends that I follow on Letterboxd. So I'm there as impossible funky. Feel free to follow me. I probably won't follow you back just because I have two or three friends that I follow and I speak with them fairly regularly. So I will be asking them like, Oh, Hey Mike, I saw that you watched legend. Um, why did you go back and watch that? Or, Hey, I've seen you watching a ton of Sofia Coppola films. What brought that on? So it helps, you know, have conversations when I meet Mike Thompson for coffee once a quarter, or when I email my friend Rich and we'll talk about, you know, oh, tell me about Pumpkin Man Lives, Rich. Uh, I would love to know more about that because the cover art looks horrendous. Uh, was it that bad of a movie? Was it a short? Those kind of things. But yeah, I will be more than happy to share my Netflix downloads with you. So to this day, I'm baffled by how you manage to do all the podcasts you do, read all the books, watch all the movies, you know, watch, you know, a special movie from a filmmaker and or watch a special, you know, not just watch the regular edit, but the fan edit and then the extended cut just for a show, how you balance all the Barney Miller, all the night gallery, all the co-hosting, all the, uh, you know, I'm probably list- forgetting like half a dozen things like, but the emails that you have to send in a given day, the interviews you have to set up, the editing, how, what's, what's a day in the life of Mike White look like? Can you describe that to us or even a week? Like, what's your spare time like? Is it just 100% emails? Uh, I mean, it baffles my mind, so I'm curious. So a day in the life of Mike White is, on the surface, probably pretty darn boring. I have everything planned out to an inch of my life. If I were to look at my calendar, even for the week that I'm recording this, uh, so I've got Sunday, watch Matador and Rankin on Bass specials. Monday, record Edo Avant-Garde interview. Also record intro to Hitchcock's Blondes. Also guest star on an episode about Almodovar's Matador. Tuesday, dig out interviews for Radiance Films for their upcoming release of a movie. Watch Sonatine. Look for a book about Jess Franco that I heard about. Wednesday, today, Ego Fest recording. Sonatine recording. Thursday, send codes to Patreon people. Also record Rankin and Bass, The Stingiest Man in Town, and The First Christmas Snow. Also, watch Just Franco's Other Side of the Mirror. Friday, record A Virgin Among the Living Dead. Saturday, have the grandkids over. Also, watch Walking the Edge. Also, take care of a book project for a friend of mine. I'm helping him lay out his book. So that's how I do this, is just every single day I have stuff on my calendar starting at 6 p.m., sometimes earlier, don't tell my boss, but sometimes earlier than that, like at lunchtime, I might record an interview. Um, I'll also have things on my calendar if I'm working at my day job, and then I'll have a movie running in the background, so I'm able to kind of absorb that. Those are usually for some of the the smaller one-off interviews that I'm doing where I don't have to pay a ton of attention to that. But obviously, if I'm doing an interview with somebody, I want to give them the courtesy of watching the movie or reading the book. So yeah, after all of those things that I'm doing uh, that you just heard my week, and when I go to bed at 10, 11 o'clock or whatever, I will then be 
reading about something for an upcoming episode. When I'm driving to and from work, I'm listening to audio commentaries or books or podcasts or whatever about the film that I'm about to cover. Right now, I am I'm listening to A Woman in the Dunes by Kobo Abe because I'm going to be doing an episode about that pretty soon. So it's always something. I'm not really reading for pleasure these days. I occasionally will listen to a book for pleasure, but mostly I've got stuff that I have to do, and that's always filling up the calendar. It also helps that when it comes to, you mentioned some of the other podcasts that I do, so like The Barney Miller Show, Chris edits that. The Night Gallery Show, Father Malone edits that. Uh, Rankin on Bass, Chris edits that. I edit these shows, and then as I have said publicly before, I actually hired an editor to help out with some stuff. I met him through Reddit, where whenever people post, like, hey, I want to edit your show, I will respond back and say, okay, here you go, and send them a Dropbox link, and... 99.9% of the time, I never hear from them again. Uh, This particular gentleman did write back and say, oh, okay, great. Here's your episode. And was able to send me a finished episode. And I gave him some notes, said, I don't really like crosstalk. I try to make this much more NPR than Morning Zoo. So he changed that up a little bit. And now I'm about to review more work and hopefully... I will have things set for later this year so that I can actually catch up a little bit and maybe even take some time off because I do have a vacation planned in November. So let's hope that uh, that actually happens. But then I do have a vacation, two vacations. Well, one's uh, for a conference and the other one is a actual vacation for the conference one. I know I'm going to have time in the evenings and in the mornings, so I will be doing a lot of editing then as well. I never sleep, just like rust. And then, of course, throughout the day, I am, yeah, emailing people, catching up on correspondence. Uh, As I'm driving to work, I'm yelling at Google, saying, set a reminder, you know, write back to this person, check in on this person, just constantly have that going and just making notes. That's the biggest thing because my memory is for shit. So if I don't make those notes to myself, I will totally forget. And that's when the whole system breaks down. Thank you, Dallas, for your questions. I really do appreciate this. All right. It is that time of the episode where I thank our Patreon donors. Rather than doing the entire list, I was just going to thank the folks that have signed up over the last few months here since I did this earlier in 2024. A little interesting, over at patreon.com slash projection booth, you can sign up as a free member. You don't get a whole lot of stuff, but you do get to keep up with uh, whenever I post things. I guess maybe I'm tantalizing you. I'm, I'm not sure why you would join up as a free member, but you can do that if you want. Or for the low, low price of $3 a month, you can get thanked in this episode, or you can jump up to five and get monthly updates, or gosh, I think at the $10 level, you get early access to everything, and it's relatively commercial free. You get access to the archives. Wow. Uh, And then, yeah, once you get up there to like the $20 level, you can actually request movies. And then there's uh, like the level that Kyler's at where he can... Come on to the Ego Fest and come on to the episode that he requested. It's it's wild, folks. A lot of good benefits over there. If you have become a donor recently and you didn't hear your name called, please let me know. And I'll make sure that I do that in the next episode. Hoping all these people are still in here because I did see the name of one person who was a member of our Patreon. Ended up quitting a little bit after and then just constantly is complaining that I'm emailing, even though I'm not, it's very bizarre. Well, that's it for ego fest 14. I hope folks have enjoyed listening to me ramble on. I definitely enjoyed being asked questions and give a little bit of behind the curtain look at what we are doing here at the show. That's the Royal. We, of course, 
All right, folks, keep the dirty side down and the shiny side up, and I'll talk to you next time. Bye.